laid us off today. Is it cheap? We'll take it. We'll take it. All right, Genesis. All right. What's the next section? History. History. Joshua. Judges. section called? Intertestament. There you go. And what are the two major collections? That A-P-O-C-R-O-F-E-H-A. Okay, that is the Apocrypha. And what does it mean? It's the good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should say it's the better of the two collections. <laughs> it's the hidden, hidden or uh, veiled writings. And what's the other one? <laughs> There you go. And what does it mean? False. False. Yeah. yeah. You can always, you know, pseudo. I mean, you know, that's a word we still use today. So when you see the first part of it, you know that that means false. So whether, whether you can figure out what the rest of it means, if you get the first part, you can figure it out. But grapha is, is writing, so pseudo just means false writing. All right, so what's our next section? Gospels. Gospels. I think most people know those yeah. pretty well. All right, what's uh, what's the next section? History. New Testament history. New Testament history. Acts. The Book of Acts. All right. What what big large section are we in now? Paul's epistles. All right. Paul's letters or Paul's epistles. All right. Romans. Very good. Ephesians. Philippians. Oh, there's a subsection. The prison epistles. All right. Now I heard somebody say it. Uh, Ephesians. Philippians. Philippians. Colossians. Now there's a kink in our structure here. There's there's one more there's one more prison epistle. I'm trying to ingrain this into you so that way when we get to Philemon, um, you'll you'll know that that's part of the prison epistles. But it's not an order. So it's, it's that one book that causes a kink in us doing that. But um, Philemon is a prison epistle, but it doesn't come next. So uh, what what came after Colossians? All right. Now, today we are starting another subsection of Paul's letters. This There's three of these books. What is the first one? First Timothy, and this is called the 
pastoral letters or pastoral epistles. And, and this, it, this section is entitled this because it deals mostly with church instruction and church leadership. So uh, that, that's the primary reason for this, the reason they call this the pastoral letters or epistles. And so, what is our first book today? First Timothy. First Timothy. Very good. All right, so we are in the book of First Timothy today. Now, it's only been recently people have really, really tried to deny that Paul wrote this. Um, but there's, again, there's the internal evidence. Uh, that Paul wrote this letter. Uh, most most people believe that uh, Paul wrote this letter immediately following his first imprisonment, uh, where he was under house arrest. Uh, so this, they um, most people think that maybe this occurred. He wrote this somewhere around 62 to 63 A.D. Um, but he he wrote this letter. Um, to Timothy. Now, Timothy was uh, in Ephesus. And so, uh, to give you an idea of where Ephesus is, it is right here. Ephesus was a seaport, a major seaport. Uh, remember, uh, we'll, we'll get to Ephesus again when we uh, cover Revelation, because that was one of the seven churches. Seven letters that are written to the seven churches in Asia Minor, which is in modern-day Turkey. Uh, but he was writing, um, we don't exactly know where Paul was when he wrote this. Um, I know many people, it's one of those things where you have to assume maybe where he was. Uh, some scholars say that he was on his fourth missionary journey. Uh, and they say perhaps uh, he wrote from somewhere on that and... Uh, when he wrote from his, what some say, his fourth missionary journey, uh, at this point he had traveled all the way to Spain um, uh, after Rome. And so um, some people think maybe he had wrote it from so somewhere from Rome over to Spain, somewhere in there where, uh, where he had been. But we don't exactly know, but we do know that he was writing to Timothy in Ephesus. So, uh, you know, in, in reading this, uh, it seems like um, it seems like they uh, Ephesus, the the church there in Ephesus, had some of the same issues that perhaps Corinth had, and so it, it, this is almost like a mini mini Corinth uh, Corinthians uh, when you look at some of the things that Paul was addressing uh, that you'll find very similar uh, that he talked about in First and Second Corinthians. Uh, but this one is a much smaller book, but it's still no less important. Now, Timothy was a young man uh, who, who Paul wrote this to. Now, Timothy was uh, like a, uh, a spiritual son to Paul. Uh, he traveled on him with missionary, on mission, some of his missionary journeys. He uh, worked with him establishing churches. And here he's leading, uh, or Tim, Timothy is pastoring uh, this this church in Ephesus. Now, you know, a young man leading a church, you know, that, that was a, that's always a difficult thing. People don't like, a lot of times people don't like to trust younger people. Uh, and if you've ever, if you've ever been a younger person in a place of leadership, you understand exactly what I just said. Um, every job I've ever had, I've been thrust into a leadership position whether I wanted it or not. Uh, sometimes it was just out of necessity, but, um, People sometimes just don't want to listen to younger people. Uh, and, and I understand sometimes reasons why. Sometimes younger people don't have the experience that an older person may have. Um, and and, and I, again, I see this issue with uh, churches as well because, you know, God knows that when I first started out in ministry, I, there was a lot I needed to learn. Uh, and there's a lot I still need to learn. But uh, again, same thing. I have found out that sometimes people don't like to listen to younger people. 
Um, I, I jokingly say this uh, in, in a way, um, you know, house and grounds uh, don't like to listen to me sometimes. Uh, even though I have extensive construction experience and have uh, worked on hundreds of thousands of million dollars uh, worth of jobs that were under my command. And, um, you know, I led groups of people, read blueprints, had to make sure the job come in on time, had to do paperwork. So, you know, sometimes house and grounds don't like to listen to a younger fellow who has ideas and knows how to do some of that. They just do what they want to. But anyway, it's all right. I move on and let them do their thing. Um, they don't like to spend money, that's, that's the problem. Well, sometimes they do. Sometimes the ideas will save them money, but they do what they want to. Well, you know how way it is. <laughs> now, what makes you think I was talking about problems? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I work with a lot of house and grounds and other We're here. 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 We're that is an issue a lot of times with older folks is they just don't trust younger people. Yeah. Especially to lead them or provide insight or anything like that. So, you know, I'm not saying that um, you should entirely dismiss a younger person. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm also not saying you should entirely dismiss older people who have been around and had experience. This is a case where, um, especially in a church situation, you should listen to each other and not just assume that the other person doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, but a lot of times that's the case. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of in a nutshell. That's kind of what Paul is dealing with here is that he has a, a group of people uh, who are, it seems to be, it, it's not explicitly said, but it seems like it indicates that uh, Timothy's having a tough time with that because Paul addresses him and tells him, says, look, just because you're younger, don't let them run over you. He says, I trust you. You're a young man who's faithful in the gospel. Lean on that. Lean on what I've taught you about the Word of God. He said, if you do that, you'll be fine. And so I believe that's what Timothy does because we never see, we don't really see Paul admonish Timothy we really see him lift him up and praise him for the job that he's doing. So Timothy must have been doing something right. <clears throat> now, when we get into our key themes, you'll see some of these things that Paul addresses here uh, in some of these other areas. Uh, so the way that you can break this book down is, uh, is, is a lot like many of his other letters. You've got an introduction, a body, and... Uh, a conclusion. So the introduction you'll find in, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. And then the next part of this you'll find the instructions concerning false doctrine. So, you know, that's not something that uh, Paul hasn't dealt with before. Uh, he's dealt with it in about every letter that he's addressed so far. So something I want you to understand is that even though there might be um, sometimes in Paul's letters... He may only address certain, you know, use the words false teaching uh, or false doctrine. He may only use it a time or, you know, just a, in a limited amount. I'm not going to say a time or two because you use it quite a bit, but uh, you might say it in, in a limited framework. But if you understand the context of what he's talking about, a great deal, a great percentage of his letters are dealing with false teaching. Uh, especially with the Gnostics. Now, the Gnostics were a group of people uh, who were claiming to be Christians who claimed to have special insight, special knowledge. And Gnostics, that the word gnos gnosis, it means knowledge or to know. Uh, Noso means to know. So this is taken from that root word, Gnostics. 
And so um, we also get another word from that called agnostics, and those are people who don't know or, you know, who, who say, well, we just don't know. And there's a lot of those folks, too. Um, and I do know some, uh, some churches who had some open agnox, agnostic people on their elder board. And this would have been a perfect example to read and teach this book to their elders and to their nominating committee. Because their nominating committee should have looked at these instructions and said, you know what? You're not qualified because you don't even believe what the Word of God says. So, you know, you might be a good person, but you're ineligible. I'm sorry. You know, sometimes people get on boards because you like them. Sometimes, you, sometimes people get on boards because, well, they just have, a, they have status. Or they may just have been around for a long time. Say, so, well, you know, we ain't got nobody else, so might as well just pick them. And I think that's where you see a lot of trouble in churches. Um, you know, you don't want to hurt people's feelings. Well, sometimes it's not about hurting people's feelings, it's just about doing what is right. And so we see a lot of that uh, contained within this book. So he deals uh, a lot with this and really a lot of this book even though he's not like I said he's not fully addressing it or saying the word false he's addressing it throughout the book uh, and we will see that again when we get to 2 Timothy now the next part of this uh, is instructions concerning the church and so there's a couple chapters here dealing with uh, different things that the church needs to do uh, like it says, it is instructions. It's telling them how to do this, this, and this, how to approach certain things. Uh, and so this is a, uh, maybe we'll talk about this in just a little bit, uh, but especially chapter 2 is a hot point. Um, well, chapter 3, really. Chapter 3 is kind of a hot point with chapter 2 and 3, I guess you'd say. It's kind of a hot point to... Uh, talk about in a lot of churches because of their theology on certain things. But Paul is giving them uh, good instruction here on what to do. Now, you know, everybody needs good leadership. Nothing runs well without uh, good leadership and good instruction. Um, now, it, for anybody that's been in the military, um, I think that's something that, you know, uh, a well-old plan, well-thought-out plan, um, are things that, that work out well. And then uh, I know, especially with a lot of the tactical units, they do a lot of specialized training where they, uh, they, turn, they, they run scenarios on what-if moments. So, you know, they look at all possible, uh, you know, scenarios, train for them and do those things. But they're well thought out, they're well trained and well instructed so that the plan carries out. Even if, it doesn't, even if every detail doesn't come out, you still have some sort of instruction, uh, well thought out instruction on how to handle a situation. This is what this, this short book, that's what it aims to do, is to hand out uh, well intentioned instruction for the church in different scenarios that have arisen. Um, the next part of this, uh, here are instructions concerning false teachers and responsibilities. Um, again, this he's taught again. He's dealing with you know uh, false false teachers. Uh, earlier, uh, he was dealing with false doctrine. Again, it kind of falls under the same thing. So again, you know, it's, even though it might be mentioned briefly, he's still dealing with it. Uh, and responsibilities comes in the form of the church. What responsibilities do we have as a church? Well, we have a lot of responsibilities. Now, he doesn't cover all of them. He's kind of broad here in what he says, but there's a couple issues here that he addresses uh, uh, more directly uh, that apparently were happening there uh, in Ephesus. And then you find the conclusion in chapter 6, verses 20 through 21. 
Now we'll look at some key themes here. Uh, one of the biggest themes here is only one. Now I have one in quotation marks because I wanted to make sure you understood that it's talking about one, it's addressing the subject is one. Only one between man and God. Uh, and the reason I say that is because this is one of the key verses. We'll, we'll talk about this when we get to the key verse. But uh, having an understanding of that there's, there's only one between man and God, um, this is a problem that the church has faced and is still facing. Um, Jesus talked about this when he said that you can't serve two masters. For most people, it's not even two masters, it's many. And so, like I said, this is a problem that the church is still dealing with uh, 2,000 years later. You know, a lot of these things that we cover are stuff that we've been dealing with for 2,000 years. Another key thing to this book is sound doctrine. Again, something that the church is having problem with. Um, we have these issues in the church. Um, you know, one I think one major doctrinal issue uh, is eternal salvation. When you look at how people approach that. Um, you know, I don't have as much problem with people who, you know, whether you take a Calvinistic view uh, of predeterminism or you take the other view, and it's escaping my mind. Um, I know it starts with an A. I can't remember. Anyway, it's, it's the view that is basically opposite of predeterminism. But anyway, I don't have a problem if you take those two views because you're still talking about salvation, but you're still talking about sinful nature and, and things that separate you from God. So, you know, those are more, uh, as we talked about, those are some theological issues that people can work through and talk about. We've talked about many of those here. The issue here of eternal salvation that a lot of uh, churches have problem with as far as the doctrinal issue is that everybody will go to heaven. And that there is no hell or something to that nature. Now that is something that is non-negotiable because that is something that the Bible clearly does not teach. The Bible does not teach that all will go to heaven. It just does not. Uh, the Bible talks more about hell than it does heaven. And so, you know, this idea that all oh, we just all, you know, we're all just going one day saying kumbaya and sit around a campfire with God and, you know, that's just what it's going to be, is utter nonsense. So when Paul's talking about sound doctrine, he's talking about foundational issues within the church that uh, are being taught that would be considered heresy. Um, you know, so I mean, there's other issues. Of course, another issue, one that, you know, uh, this church uh, not, not dealt with in this church, but has dealt with with the group that we were with is this uh, idea of the atonement of Christ. Again, that is a doctrinal, foundational issue where there is no negotiation. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. The Bible makes that plain as day. The Old Testament points to it. It predicts it. It happens. And he rises from an empty tomb. That is foundational doctrine right there. there is, it is non-negotiable. But there are churches, I don't know how you call yourself a church or a Christian, if you deny the crucifixion, if you deny the atonement of Jesus Christ, but there are some who do. That is a non-negotiable issue. We, we will not negotiate on that. So that, these are the things that, that Paul is talking about. Because there's a number of issues that we can talk about that kind of fall into that theological realm of where we talk about having maybe a different a different belief, maybe on how the end times will shake out. We've talked about that before. Or, you know, um, 
if someone wants to eat a certain way versus eating another way, whatever. Those are things, those are not foundational doctrinal issues that are going to keep you out of heaven. So that's these are the things that Paul's not he's not talking about those. He's talking about foundational doctrinal issues. That's what he's discussing. How about the, the, the denominations? They they get the churches get so liberal that they just bring up stuff that's off the wall. You know what I mean? And and it's just hasn't got anything to do with God. Yeah, uh, that's that's true. You know, it, um, and a lot of that falls on the church because you know those things don't just happen overnight. Yeah. You know, those things take time to fester, and it's because churches. You know, again, this is something that this book addresses: is that you know, whenever problems arise like that. You don't just let them go. You deal with them. Right. Now, there, there's a proper way of dealing with these things. And it talks about this book and other books that Paul has written. talks about how to deal with those in a Christian manner. You know, he, he never talks about dealing with them harshly. Now, he talks about dealing with them firmly, but not harshly, not unlovingly. And that's the problem that we have in a lot of churches is that... You know, a lot of people think, well, if you if you say something to somebody that they may be doing wrong, that for some reason you might not like them or you might hurt their feelings. Who cares? If it's going to affect their eternal salvation, then I think you ought to tell them the truth, Amen. right? That's right. And that's a problem that we have in today's society, especially in today's church. Is where nobody wants to tell the truth. They want to coddle people. Well, it's what the, the Baptists, you know, they have several <laughs> brothers, uh, Dakins or whatever, and they'll go to the, this one person and tell him, you know, he's wrong, you know. And uh, the alternative could leave the church, you know. Yeah, and that's something I think sometimes we need to be careful with because what one person might be see is wrong like and I've encountered this in churches how people dress now I know there are some Baptist churches and they've been really they're getting better about this but for the longest time they're liberal uh, they're not liberal as, as they were they were demonizing people because they weren't wearing what they think they ought to wear and, and you know, that and some other things. So, you know. Well, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that people wear at my church that I don't agree with. And. Well, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. But they come for one purpose, to praise the Lord. Well, that's, that's right. That's what I'm talking about, is that there are some people who might say, well, Biblically, they're wrong when they're really not. So this is one of those things where you have, you've got to use caution because what one person might be. That's right. You know, that's that's all I'm my, saying. My standards might be not be the same as the other guy. Right. So that's all I'm saying. I, I'm not saying that you know we uh, we have to all agree on what everybody should wear or what everybody should listen to or what everybody should eat. That's that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that in those moments. Because I think, Justin, I think you shared with me one time. Uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, and maybe I misheard you, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But I, it seemed like to me you were telling me that years, this has been a long time ago. Um, I want to say you may have went to a church where they had a guy stand up who had long hair, and they admonished him. Or you were telling, telling me about somebody uh, that, that had it, the experience that, like I said, it's been a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I know this has been at least a decade or more ago. Um, but I, I remember it stuck out in my mind because I always remember, like, how could they do that? You know, how, how could they make somebody stand up in church because of the length of their hair and admonish them 
To me, that's just like, you know, that's one of those issues that who cares? You know, if, if it's a younger person there worshiping God, I don't care how long their hair is. You know, your the length of your hair is not going to keep you out of heaven. Again, but it's those, a bad thing. That's all it is. You know, so that's that's all I'm saying is that when we get when we get diving into issues like that, we need to be really careful about how we handle those because what some people think is biblical really isn't. And so, you know, again, the things that Paul was dealing with as far as sound doctrine are things that are purely biblical foundational issues. That's why any time I talk to somebody and they will tell me something, my thing is always like it's something I go to because I don't know. My, my, my response is, well, show me the Bible where it says that, show me. And that's, that's what I tell people because I don't know that, I'm not sure. Well, show me. Mm -hmm. Show me. Yeah. That's all I ask. Show me biblical. Yeah. I think that's where people need to go back to. They have proof to back up what you think and say. I don't argue about nothing. Yeah. But I walk away, but show me. That's my thing, show me. Yeah. Well, a lot of people leave, and uh, I don't see anybody in here with suspenders on, but <laughs> they go over to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, and says, uh, you should have suspenders on. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for the honor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he fall, he fall up, for he hath not another to help him up. Yeah. Yeah. Hope you wear suspenders. <laughs> if you want to make it out of context, and that's what people do. I got a cousin that that's, he, ex he got, that's exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. I got a cousin that he, 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 he had earrings back 20 years ago. And he came up to me and he said, Terry, he said, you know, you're the only one in the family that, uh, that doesn't say anything about my earring. I said, uh, his name's Julian. I said, Julian? I said, uh, I don't care if you wear your earring or not. He said, don't bother me, you know. I mean, by, my word says it's by our fruits that we're it on. Yeah. So not by what we wear, not yeah. by what we uh, actually look like, or yeah. you know, it's by the fruits. Yeah. If you're not bearing fruit for Jesus, then yeah. something's wrong. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good thing he doesn't hold us to the standard of wearing suspenders. I know. We've all, <laughs> We've all fallen short this morning, haven't we? <laughs> but that, those well, are they the, got, didn't uh, certain people, when you first come here, they got on you about dressing casual, didn't they? Yeah. Well, there, there's still some folks who don't care for it, but, <laughs> I, you know, to me, that's, that's a moot point. I don't, you know. It, some some people some people think pastors should wear a three piece suit all day every day. Uh, so I can't remember if it was here or another church I was at, but there was a pastor who was mowing the yard, yeah. and somebody came by and saw him with their shirt off. It was like during the middle of the summer, it's hot, yeah. and they asked why was he not in a suit. Uh, to me, I thought that was just one of the dumbest. Yeah. That was one of the dumbest comments maybe yeah. ever made in the history of churching. Is you know why, why was he mowing the yard not wearing his suit? How dumb! Wearing a birthday suit. <laughs> you know. So I mean, it's just it's things like that. That those are the things I'm talking about. You know, it's people people make up doctrinal issues. The devil loves. It. Yes. Oh yeah. Because it creates a lot of division and hostility. And as Terry said, it's more about the fruit that you bear. Jesus told us, he said, you will know, you will, you will know us, Christians, you will know your brothers and sisters by the fruit that they bear. And so, you know, that's the number one thing is, is doing that. So sound doctrine is very, very important. Uh, right living. There, there we go with the fruit bearing. Um, right living definitely has uh, a lot to do. Now this, um, you know, how, how do we know how to live? It's real easy. Yep, there you go. Point to this right here. Yeah. And, you know, some of the things that we've talked about, it requires a little more than just reading. We need to study. Because there, there's issues in here that are, are not cut and dry. And we are 2,000 years removed from a culture when this was written. 
And there are things in here that do not directly deal with us today as far as how we interact in our everyday lives. Uh, there's some things in this book that talk about that. Um, however, much of this is timeless. It is eternal. And we learn how to live by this and this alone. Uh, there's, there's nothing in our lives that we can't address by simply reading this word and studying it and praying to God to the Holy Spirit, help me. Now remember that Holy Spirit is called the Comforter and is also called the Helper. There's a good reason for that. Because the word talks about how the Helper will come, comfort us, give us words, it will reveal to us things that we need in our time of need. So we just have to be open and listen to that. But you got to ask him. you got to ask him. Sometimes he'll butt in. Yes, yes sometimes sometimes he'll be intrusive. He'll butt in and uh, he'll let you know. But the scripture says if you want wisdom, ask him. Well, I think that comes with growing. That comes with maturity. Um, you know, growing in the Lord. Those are things that should grow over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that, that's faith. But uh, that's, that's right. But sometimes, you know, just uh, sometimes, well, we've all done this. We've all done things we know we shouldn't have. Right. Uh, and did, did, at that moment, did we ask God to show us we were wrong? Sometimes we do. But more often than not, if we do something wrong, all of a sudden, God butts in and says, Hey, 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 hey. hey. You're Stop right. it! Right. Stop doing it! Sometimes you listen, sometimes you don't. Yep, and then, then he'll send the bigger sign. Knocking the head. Yeah. <laughs> I always think about, uh, I don't know if y'all ever seen Evan Almighty. Um, not Evan, not Bruce Almighty. It was, that's the first one. But um, Jim Carrey, he's, he's the actor, and, and um, he has a problem with religion in general. And so God, you know, trades places with him and said, well, if it's so easy here, here's all my power here. You do what you think is best. And so he, he did everything wrong. Um, but, you know, he's uh, there towards the end of the movie. Uh, he's, he's driving down the road and he's like really getting serious. And he's like, Lord, just give me a sign. And, and there's a big sign on the side of the road that says, you know, caution ahead or whatever. And he says, he said, I mean it, Lord, I, I need a sign. And then a, a truck, like a state truck, pulls in front of him, and it is loaded with signs, like all different kinds of stock, caution, all these different kinds of signs. And so he's like, he's not, God's giving him signs, but he ain't paying attention. And uh, then he, he has a terrible accident. Uh, but anyway, he learned from that. Um, but I always think of that when I ever think about God giving us signs. Do we pay attention when he does? Sometimes they're very obvious. We just choose to ignore them. Um, but right living, uh, I think, is very important to this next uh, key thing, evangelism. Because um, proper evangelism, um, you know, kind of deals with us, how we live. Uh, it's kind of hard for somebody who doesn't bear much fruit, uh, who doesn't live uh, biblically, um, you're not going to do real good evangelistically. And, you know, I think un unbelievers, unbelievers look at, at believers, uh, you know, we're always looked at and processed through a microscope. Uh, most unbelievers are watching us to see how we're living and to see how we react uh, in situations. And that's one of the things, you know, I'm sure you've heard it before, you know, it's like, well, you know, I don't want to go to church and sit with them hypocrites. Well, I mean, yeah, we're all hypocrites, you know. Um, so, you know, people need to understand that. I remember that saying when I was a cute or teenager, like, I'd really go to church and go to hell with them. Yeah, that's right. We all are. That's right. Um, but, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, there, you know, it may not be an entirely true statement, uh, but there is some truth to that as far as, you know, people, people from the outside who don't go to church, maybe they're inclined to come to church 
And, you know, they see somebody there that they interact with quite a lot. And they see how they act outside of church. And they're like, well, if that's what they're teaching here, then why am I here? Because I don't do half the stuff they do. So, you know, it, the way that we carry and conduct ourselves uh, in, in private and public, you know, it makes a difference to evangelism and things like that. So it's, it's very important. Uh, how we do things. A lot of people don't go to church. They they get they your own line, you know. And I mean, at our church, we got people all over the United States watch our service. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's I think it's one thing um, if you're from another state and you want to see a service somewhere else. That's fine, uh, but if. But if you're within driving distance of that uh, reasonable sure, driving right. distance, uh, yeah. then yeah. you know don't sit at home. Get in your get in your car. Well, people after the this church. COVID and everything, people got comfortable they, and, and, and didn't want to come to church. Just like you got the people at the parking lot. Come in. Won't come in inside. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean it's. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to get into that because, you know, we've talked about that at length many times before, and yeah. I, I still don't quite understand it. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I understand being cautious. I mean, that's yeah. one thing, but just being just being so fearful Scared. and, Scared. you know, not, not, not understanding your own faith. How? Oh, ye of little faith. You know, to me... I find it as an excuse. That, I mean, to me, that's all I see it as. I mean, personally, I wish we'd get rid of it. I wish we'd get rid of the outside thing. But we're, we're far beyond that. People need to come inside. And it have been for a long time. I thought it was over. I mean, you know, it's all out. Come that one Sunday. And, and people were outside. They were still out there. It's just not like it was. But, uh, you know, I, I just hate to know I live my life in such fear. Yeah. I really do. Um, but the next thing is, uh, the next key thing is is a big one. Uh, we talked about this already a little bit, uh, but standards of church leaders. Um, not everybody's cut out for leadership. Uh, just because somebody has status or somebody's been involved, you know, been attending a church for a long time, doesn't mean that they need to be where they are. Uh, the same can be said, and me and Terry was talking about this, the same can be said uh, for pastors. Uh, there are some pastors who have not been called. Uh, they have decided that they're going to be pastors. And if you decide that, then you, it's not going to work out well right. for you. Or it may work out well for you, but you know you might see the devil in hell. Um, you know. Eventually. Now don't, now don't, that's not, I'm not, that's not Bible there. <laughs> I'm just saying that there are people sometimes who go into ministry under false pretenses um, because they think we work one hour a week and um, make good money. You know? Um, now, a Baptist preacher, they might make, you know, they might do all right. <laughs> Quaker preachers, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We're still a little behind, but uh, I, I think they're, they're starting to get better. But, uh, you know, I mean, it, you know, that's something. Again, Paul deals with that in this letter, too, talking about people within the church uh, who hold a standard of living uh, in higher regard than the standard of holy living. Um, he talks about uh, money, the love of money. And how it affects so many things, and you know, um, again, the standard of a church leader is—it's very important, I think, to the health of a church, because um, you've got to have people who who stand on the foundational word. You can't have somebody that's wishy-washy. Um, now, I mean, you know. It, there's plenty of areas to serve in the church. 
uh, where you know there's less restriction you know I, I can see that um, you know but as far as when it comes to those who teach those who oversee and those who pastor uh, there are some strict guidelines that I think churches need to abide by and again he calls into question the um, the fruit that they bear their standard of living uh, how they maintain their households uh, things like that so it, it is very it is very strict in its nature and again this is one of those issues where you know I said it's kind of been a hot button uh, and I've, I've heard this come up at um, you know the group that we separated with uh, whenever we were talking about uh, refusing to uh, record a openly homosexual person and uh, we said well that's just not biblical well some smart aleck got up and said well, uh, well what about some of these some of these ministers who've been married before and you know sometimes they will go to uh, a passage in this book and so initially you know my, my first response is 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 okay well you don't have a valid point because you've never really read the Bible and you don't understand it at all um, again they don't understand context they don't understand where the book was written um, Paul's dealing with problems they you know there was a lot of they believed in polygamy you know having more than one wife no big deal so Paul's dealing with issues, and people need to understand that. You know, uh, Jesus addressed this with his uh, the, the the Pharisees who brought up you know the idea of you know they were trying to trap him, and he uh, they had come up and asked him this question about um, a woman who had been married a bunch of times and said, well, who's she going to be married to in heaven? So he had to set them straight. Um, but there was some there was some cultural things that were going on at the time that Jesus was also addressing that maybe he didn't quite say, but he was addressing. Number one was the fact that there was a lot of these Jewish people who were divorcing people uh, because you know their wives may have overcooked their dinner. Now does, does that seem like grounds for divorce? So it was over. You know there were a lot of Jews. Who were giving certificates of divorce over seemingly nothing, nothing burgers as we call them today. That's what it was. And so, you know, these are things that people don't understand context because they don't study the scripture and they take one scripture and use it to try and benefit some agenda or some idea that they have. You've got to take scripture into context. Now, as far as, you know, the homosexual issue, that's cut and dry in the Bible. It's forbidden. And then when you start talking about leadership in the church, yes, it's expressly forbidden. So, you know, it's not about not loving people. It, it never says that. But accepting, it, putting people into positions that do not need to be there based on their living standards, based on how they live. Now, again, it doesn't say that we're not to love them. No, not at all. We're supposed to love them just as we do somebody who's a brother or sister in Christ. That, that's what God tells us. That's what the Word of God tells us. But as far as, as, as far as us putting them in a place of leadership, that is forbidden to do. Uh, it, that is not hidden or veiled in the Bible. That's, that's what it says. And so... And I think that's an area where, you know, as far as how we talk about how to deal with marital issues in the church, as far as adultery, uh, divorce, I think those are things the church has failed on in a lot of ways. Uh, but also the homosexual issue, we failed on that because it seemed like at one time the church was overbearing, where they uh, were really hateful to someone who may live that way to where the pendulum has swung all the way the opposite way of where a lot in the church are completely accepting of sinful behavior. You know, 
Um, so it's like, where's that, where's that middle of being loving and accepting of people without compromising the Word of God? Where are we at there? You know, and, and the church has failed on a lot of these fronts. Um, again, it comes from studying the Bible uh, and really understanding what it says. So the standard of church leaders is very, very important. Now, to look at some key verses here. Our first key verse comes from verses 3 through 4. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 4 says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Now, couple things here he talks about um, he talks about charge certain persons so evidently there's some uh, particular people who are causing some issues so Paul is addressing certain people in this in this in this work without naming them but um, Timothy would have known who they were uh, so or he would come to know who they were anyway uh, but he talks about this idea that they need to be charged not to teach certain doctrines. Now, why would we, why would we say you don't need to teach that? Because it's not right. You're leading in the, you're leading in the wrong direction. You're exactly. Not now, here, this is just me giving you an illustration. If I stood up one Sunday and I said that. Uh, I said, well, you know, I've come to this belief that this man, this historical Jesus, um, didn't die on the cross. I think it's, uh, it's too bloody for me to accept, and I just can't believe that God would send uh, himself, his son, uh, into the world to die in such a way, and I, I think that he's... Uh, he's already saved me because I'm made in his image and uh, we're all going to be there together. Now, what would you say? What? <laughs> Get out. <laughs> I, hope, I hope somebody would have me by the ear pulling me from the pulpit. Um, I would hope that there would be some people who would immediately say, uh, you're wrong. But there are people, and I'll give you a perfect example. There's a, um, I read about this several years ago. There was a pastor out in Oklahoma who had built up a church from about nothing. It was, uh, I think he had taken it over and he had, uh, you know, it, it went from not a lot of members to over, I think it was over 1,200, like really quickly. Well, um, one day, one Sunday, he started teaching universalism. Everybody was going to go to heaven. Um, and half the church left. The other half stayed. This church had grew over 1,200 people. Only half left. There were still over 600 people listening to false doctrine. Something that was unbiblical. There's a lot of that that happens in churches. So, you know, uh, when, when Paul is, is saying that there are things that people need to be taught, uh, you don't need to teach that. Those are the things he's talking about. Sound doctrine. Paul always points back to where, to what he learned 
and who he got it from. He points back to the scriptures. Because remember, the Old Testament scriptures was what he had. You know, his, some of his letters by this point had started being circulated. But he was relying on the Old Testament scriptures. The New Testament scriptures, again, some have been circulated. By this time, two of the Gospels had been written and were being circulated. So you have the, the account of Jesus being circulated. But who was Paul claiming that he got his message from? Was it from some philosopher? Was it from some teacher that he learned uh, from under uh, a Jewish scholar? Because we know he named him. We know who he learned under. Who did he name? God. God. Right. He named Jesus. Jesus was the author of his knowledge. He claimed that everything that he got, he got from the scriptures who pointed to the Christ, whom he met, and now is relaying that message. So when he's talking about sound doctrine, he said, you know, they don't need to teach a different doctrine. He's talking about these doctrines that a lot of these Gnostic false teachers were saying that we have secret knowledge. We, we have knowledge that has been given to us. We're enlightened and know things that you don't. Sound like some political minds. <laughs> uh, well, I have, been, I have been to churches that uh, <laughs> I went to a church my daughter at, at, up in Montana one time and uh, I had my Bible but nobody else, nobody else but the preacher had, right. had one. Mm -hmm. It was a third of yeah. Well, there, there's, there are some denominations who, where the the person who's leading, whether, whatever you know, whatever title they hold, again, that's something I think is ridiculous. Is some of these titles, something that Paul talks about as well. Um, but there's, there's a lot of these people who they preach from a lectionary. These are pre-written sermons that they recycle each Sunday. Uh, special events like, huh? You're talking about the Baptist Church. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you. Thankfully, thankfully, I think the, the Methodist Church that I went to uh, when I first started back going to church, thankfully they didn't do that. Uh, but uh, in, in some of these denominations, like you'll find in uh, some Episcopal Church, uh, Presbyterian churches, uh, but you'll find this mostly, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but most mostly Catholic churches uh, do that. Now, now, I have seen some Catholic preachers who, you know, have some smaller denominate or some smaller churches. Now, they'll, they'll preach the gospel and they'll preach it with fire. I mean, it's, it's totally, it's like, you know, it, it looks different from what you normally see a come from a Catholic uh, preacher. But, you know, most of the time in these, these denominations, you'll, you'll find where they read at a, a pre-written material. Now, you know, the other week, while I was watering my garden on Saturday night, God changed my mind. And he, he said, you're not going to preach on what you thought you were tomorrow. You're going to preach on something else. Now, if, if, if I was preaching out of that lectionary every Sunday... And I didn't rely on the Holy Spirit at all. I'd have been disobeying God if I'd said, well, Lord, I'm just going to preach what I want to. But he didn't. He told me, he said, this is what you're going to do. And you better do it. And I did. Well, I've been into some of the best uh, sermons. Uh, the preacher didn't say anything. The Holy Spirit took over and people give testimonies. And that was that was a good service. Yep. You know, I hate to say it, you don't see it too much in Quaker churches. That's a shame. Over here in open worship, I never got up and preached. I had open worship first and I just took over. It's a... Uh, I got them on one hand, but I think it's only happened once. 
in uh, the, the almost 10 years that I've been a full-time minister, I've seen it once. And, you know, I've always thought for people who said that they were so spiritually enlightened and were so in touch with the Holy Spirit, there'd be more of that. But they don't like to testify. Uh, I don't think you ought to testify just to be testifying. I think sometimes people do that. Um, you know, people do need to listen to the Holy Spirit. And so I've always, you know, and maybe I'm wrong, but I've been under the impression that, you know, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And if nobody ever speaks during open worship, then the Holy Spirit is not talking to you. And to have an entire group of people who never speak, you know, I, to me, I find that kind of baffling. Um, and a lot of times disheartening because they're, you know, out of, you know, at least 50 people who show up, one person ought to have something. That's right. You know. Amen. They ought to have something. I just, I find it hard to believe that, um, I just find it hard to believe, but anyway, um, at least raise your hand. Anyway, I, I'm I'm not trying to pick on this church or other ones I've served at, but you know that's just something I've always thought. Is I don't I don't know why people can't testify, and I think at least in, in part for some Quakers they've been taught to be quiet, and that's wrong. I don't think that's entirely biblical. We're one of the few denominations, I call us denominations, that give you an opportunity. Yeah. I mean, you know, go to, go to most denominations, you'll never get a chance mm -hmm. unless you just stand up. Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Cheryl's on your heart. I know, we, 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 we even get you, yeah, you're right. We give the opportunity for you to share what's on your heart. You are right, we give you a primer. Right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I have? I've never thought about that way. But you, you are exactly right. You're exactly right. I've never thought about it that way. What did he say? Say it again. Oh, he, he, he said that we're one of the few denominations that actually provide an invitation to stand up and testify. So, you know, and I said, well, I said, yeah, we provide a primer, you know, to, to get people kick-started. So, yeah, you're right. And our testimony in the blood of the Lamb, you know what you it, it baffles me. I've, I've talked about it till I'm nearly blue in the face. So, you know, I know, this, I know everybody here this, heard it. <laughs> they, it, it. The church I go to has, oh, I used to say it, they have, they, they have covenants mm -hmm. that you sign. Yeah. Uh, me and Nancy hadn't signed anything. I'm signing blood, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking to God. Yeah. There's no denominations in heaven. Yeah. You know, some, uh, I've, I've heard tell of, I've heard of that. Um, I've heard of uh, some, some churches in the area who, they don't do membership. Yeah, like, like same, thing, same thing. Same thing. Um, they ask them to sign one-year commitments that they that they will commit to serving, you know, the church. You know, and I, I guess you know there's some pros and cons to that, but you know, just start serving serving God. You know, serving serving Christ as your Lord and Savior. I mean, it, it, that, I, that's what you need to worry if about. If you go to church and you pay your tithes. What else can you do? Well, you know, you for, for your time. I will, I will say this for some newer churches. I understand some of some of the reasons why they do that is because they might not be in a, a, a structure like we have, um, where we have a building that's been established here for a long time, yeah. and we also have a cemetery. Now, how expensive is it for cemetery plots? 
I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about if you uh, go outside the church. Probably eight, eight to ten thousand dollars. All right. Yeah. If you become a member of a church, how much does it cost usually? Zero. Zero. Yes. So I understand why maybe more established churches do things like that. Because how many people do you think would become members just so that they could get a free barrel plot? <laughs> Hey, I think it's been a lot of. Yeah. But see, but in that though, see the church, in a way, the church has the power to say, look, even though you're a member, you never come, you're not active. You know, the church has the power to say, you know, well, we're going to dismiss your membership. A church can do that. They're within their rights to do that. Um, but here's the thing: before we ever get to that point. How much discernment process goes into the person that we're saying who wants to be a member? How much discernment process are we putting into that? Say, you know what? Let's uh, let's let you become a member in the first place. I think the Bible speaks more on that than it does the other things. Don't you think? Yeah. Well, it's been 12 years ago. Wayne, Wayne could was waving the papers in front of my face. He just knew he was going to sign. Just knew it. At least <laughs> 12 years ago. Yeah. I'd love for Judy and Leroy <laughs> to become members. But we'll, uh, when the time is right and the Holy Spirit says, says so, then they'll make that decision. So I, I've given you an open invitation. We'd love to have you, but that's that's between you and God. Amen. That's between you and God. That's what I told you. Can you get ready to be yep. with your one that, That's between that's between you that's and God. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Yeah. 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 And so, um, you know, the the next part of this is uh, verse four it says, "Nor to devote themselves to myths and in, endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith." Now, this this part here, uh, this is where I was talking about the Gnostic Gospels. Um, there, there were, well, the Gnostic Gospels were written much later, but these Gnostics said that they had special in, intuition, that they had this special enlightenment, and they would say things that were not recorded in Scripture. And so, you know, that, that's one of those things that Paul's dealing with here is he's talking about, you know, these endless genealogies that somehow, you know, proved that they were, um, you know, more spiritual than, than they were, or they... You know, something crazy like that, or some kind of myth. Paul's telling them, look, you need to quit wasting your time on these matters and spend your time on the Word of God, what the Word of God says. That's all, I mean, that's not that hard of a concept. You know, that's what we need to do as a church, spend more time on, on the Word of God than, you know, a lot of things. You know, how many churches spend so much time on things that don't even have anything to do with the Word of God? So, you know, he's got. You know, prestige he's talking about, too. Yeah. People that say, well, my, my family started this church. Yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, they think that gives them a special privilege that yet the blood's never been atoned on, yeah. their, on their soul. Yeah. And of course, yeah. the devil's sitting there laughing and saying, yeah, I got this one. I got this yeah. one. Oh, devil, the devil's at work, folks. Yeah. yeah. I, I've always. Uh, on the trail. You know, short. you know, not not just Quakers. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of most denominations have some sort of tradition or traditions or, or things that they lean on very heavily. Um, but one one of the things that I always found kind of humorous is uh, this idea of being a birthright Quaker. That somehow that gives you something special, and. Uh, I hate to burst it to somebody, but it don't. Um, I guess I'm a birthright Quaker. I was born into a Quaker church by a mother who was, um, you know, was a member of a, a Quaker church and, you know, was for a long time. And I'm, here I am pastoring, you know, Quaker churches. But uh, the only way I'm getting to heaven is uh, by being saved by the blood of the Lamb. That's right, amen. I'll get this way. If, if, in, uh, my first wife was a birthright Quaker, Randall Brands. That ought to give, put a little more responsibility on you as a birthright 
if you if you believe in Christ, mm -hmm. you ought to be more committed to it. I'm a convinced friend, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you about it. I'm a convinced friend. I was raised in the Methodist Church, but uh, my ways are the way of friends. When I when I found out how the friends believed, I said, "That's me," and that's why I'm still here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I, I think it ought to get put a little bit more responsibility on that uh, birthright friend than a uh, person like me. You know, that's, you know, a but here, here's the thing. Here, here's why I say that, that is because there are people who think that that that's is their it. ticket. That's their that saves them, and uh, it's just like water baptism. I mean, a lot. Well, I've been baptized with water, man's water. <laughs> or the Holy Spirit, you know, and you start to question and, yeah. and you can tell by the fruits that they've never been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. They're just leaning on that and Baptist Church, forgive me, the Baptist Church is the, uh, the best to want to just baptize somebody and then they never mature them. Mm -hmm. They let them run out little children the rest of their lives in the, in the church. They don't never let them grow. I mean, uh, my, you know, I've had years that I was involved in the Baptist Church and that's what I saw. I thought, this is not where your friends. Where your friends is, we mature you. That's what our job is as ministers and as elders. Not just the minister, elders. The people that are leaders in that church. Your job is to mature. Let's get them off the bottle. Let's get them on, on the stake. I like yeah. stake. You like milk all the time? Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I love milk, but I don't like it all the time. <laughs> old little steak over there is too old. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to shut up. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. what, what, it, what it boils down to. It's level at the cross. Yeah. And and every everybody come in this world as a sinner. That's right. That's exactly right. Yep. But you know, here, you know, in this he's talking about the stewardship that comes from, from faith. So that, that puts a responsibility on us, an accountability on us. That what God has given us, we are to use wisely for His kingdom. And unfortunately, a lot of us haven't over the years. You know, our hope is that we get better. Our prayers that we get better. But a lot of times, you know, especially today, a lot of Christians are just lazy. They, they don't want to do anything. So we got to work on that. We got we got lots of work to do there. Our next key verse comes from chapter one, also. Verses 12 through 16. Oops. <laughs> oh, there's my carpal tunnel coming into to play. That's a way. I can't, can't hold on to stuff. No, that's carpal tunnel. I, I feel like I've got it and then it just falls out of my hand. I did. I did. <sighs> I, I, I resent that old, old comment. <laughs> You don't do that when you got a, I'm, I'm not a old. I'm experienced. <laughs> I'm more experienced than I was a year ago. Uh, verse 12 says, I think, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost... Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience, his perfect patience, as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And and the, these these scriptures here to me are very powerful because it talks about how God spoke to Paul when he was Saul, when he was Saul the blasphemer, Saul the persecutor. Uh, the, the 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 person who was who thought he was fighting for God but was really fighting against him but he said notice here he he thanks God for his rich mercy and for his rich grace he 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 shares that even though he was a sinner that Christ 
gave him something that he did not deserve. That's grace, undeserved favor. And he also talks about God granting him mercy because as a sinner, he did deserve something, but Christ didn't give it to him. So right there, Paul gives us two definitions of grace and mercy. That's everybody. Right, but here's what he's doing. Look at what he's saying. He's testifying. He's testifying. He said, I was formerly of this old creation, this old man, but Christ has made me new. By His grace and mercy, by giving me something I didn't deserve, keeping me from something I did deserve. And He said, I'm not just a sinner, I'm the foremost sinner. So, you know, He's showing a lot of things here. He's He's being humble, but he's bragging on God. He's testifying to what Jesus has done for him. That's the reason why he's able to say the things he does. He's giving credit to Christ. As Christians, to me, I believe this is our purpose. I think every Christian has the same purpose in life. We may all have different callings. He gave us different, uh, different, uh, you know, these different uh, fruit, uh, these different fruits to display for him. These, uh, these different gifts. But as far as our purpose, our purpose is to tell people what Jesus has done right. for us. Right. I think we all share in the same purpose, and Paul's putting that on full display here. He's admitting fully that he was a sinner and that he's he's the worst. He's the worst of sinners. But Christ saved him. Christ loved him. No matter what he had done, Christ saved him from that, gave him a new life. And now, and now that's, what he's, uh, that's what he's living his life on is this faithfulness in Jesus Christ because of what Jesus has done for him. And we know through Paul's other letters, we know that you know up to this point when he changed his life, you know, he's, so it's been probably, He's probably been in the ministry by this point uh, by some maybe 20 plus years. You know, a lot of times we don't think of Paul being in ministry that long by this point, but he had. Uh, his conversion came right after uh, Jesus was crucified on the cross. So by this point, if he wrote this in 62, 63 AD, you know, he had been a Christian for well, about 20 years. Yeah, 25 years, somewhere along in there. But he had been beaten nearly to death on multiple occasions. He had already been in prison. And think about what he was writing here. He was telling people about what Christ has done for him. He didn't go out and say, oh, woe is me. I've been beaten. I've been almost killed. I mean, he talks about it, but he talks about how that was an honor for the sake of Christ. That he be counted worthy for those things. Because he did that for the sake of Christ. So again, this is all testimony. This is, these are the things that people stand up and tell people. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me today. Let me tell you what he's done this week for me. Because he's done something for all of us. We need, we need to share that. But also, he, he, he said here, if you read this, this is an evangelistic tool. He's saying, I share these things so that other unbelievers, other sinners, might see an example so that they might choose eternal life. So I think a lot of times we miss these nuggets. These are some gold nuggets here. You know, I think sometimes when people look at these short letters, they don't really look at them. They don't really read them like they, they should. But this is important. You see how much time we've already spent on just a few verses? Because there, there's a lot to talk about. Our next key verse comes out of chapter 2, verse 5. It's always been one of my favorite ones. 
1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, because I've used this one on the job site before. I had it whenever I had to wear a hard hat on the job site. I had this on I had this written on I had the verse written on my hard hat. And people would come up and ask me, what is that verse? So I tell them. And there was this there was this one guy, I got big friends with him, and he had a hard time with this verse because he was he was he was pretty devout Catholic. But it says here, for there is one God. And there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now this doesn't say a priest. Doesn't say some other entity. It said there ain't but one. There's one mediator. Which means you don't have to come to your pastor and tell them all your sins. You can go right to God. You go right through Jesus Christ and He's going to give you, He's going to get you right there. You know, John 14, 6. What does Jesus say? I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. You know, I keep missing that part where it says, Wait, you, you can get you can get you can get to the Father if you go through the priest and you know tell him these things. Do a few Hail Marys and you know uh, do these things and you'll be set. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of people believe. But it's very clear in Scripture. If you read Scripture, it's very clear. There is one. Now, break this Scripture down. There's several things here that we can deal with in that day and age and in our present day and age. This Scripture talks about being against atheism. Because here, here it says, there's a God. Paul is exclaiming that there is a God. So this is talking about, this is being against atheism. He's proclaiming, there is a God. Now, not only that, here's what else he says. In this very short verse, it's against polytheism. Because he says, there is one God. See, polytheism is something that they dealt with, uh, Paul had to deal with a lot. Is because in a lot of these these big these Greco-Roman cities, they believed in many gods. You know, in Ephesus, you know, the, they had many temples built to many different gods and goddesses. So he says, not only is there a god, but there's only one of them. So it's against polytheism, but it's also against pantheism. Now, pantheism is, is what you'll find in some modern-day um, uh, religions like Hinduism. Um, you know, they, they believe in this idea that uh, everything is a god. All of creation is somewhat, some kind of a god or goddess or, you know, something like that. He says, no, it's against that too. Because in this, he's demonstrating... Uh, and, and you find this throughout the Word of God that that God demonstrates that there is a a, a clear difference between man, I'm talking about men and women, and creation. Creation doesn't answer to the sinfulness, but man does. So there is a there is a clear separation from God and His people. And there is a mediator who bridges that gap. And that is Jesus Christ. So again, here's a clear distinction that man has that separation from God and there's only one way to fix it. This is also against pluralism. Uh, in, in Old Testament times, we might have called this syncretism. It's where they would take aspects of different religious beliefs and put them together. Today we see that in a lot of modern uh, type churches where they, they do put different uh, different religious aspects together. I know there was something popular on the West Coast. I haven't heard much from it lately, but it was called Chrislam, where they take aspects of Christianity and Islam and put them together. 
Now that's like mixing oil and water. They just don't mix. Uh, I, I know that uh, let me say I'm not going to say gospel of truth here. I'm not going to say um, about what, what I'm about to say as the gospel because I was not there. It doesn't surprise me because of other things that I have seen come from there. But from a particular, particularly well-known Quaker college that I will not name, but I think you know which one I'm talking about. It was being taught that you could be a Buddhist Quaker, a Hindu Quaker, an atheist Quaker. That's pluralism. That's taking different aspects of different religious beliefs and trying to put them with something else. Jesus talked about that. You can only serve one master. You cannot serve two masters or more. You can serve one. And again, that's what this is saying here. There is not, there's not many paths to God. There is one. And it is Jesus Christ. It's very clear. You cannot get to the Father except through Christ. So there are not many paths in many ways. There is one. So again, again, there's a lot of teaching in this one verse. So you see what I'm talking about? There's a lot of rich teaching in this book, in this small letter. A lot of things that Paul says. We can go directly to Jesus Christ. Excellent. Yeah, praise the Lord. Our next key verse comes out of chapter 3, verse 1. It says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Now, if you just take that into consideration this is this is Paul talking about a pastor uh, talking about someone who would be a leader of a church uh, he says that this is a noble task um, when when you look at that um, when you do some digging about the the wording there that he uses um, it's I think we kind of gloss over it, but he's talking about this is not something that's easy. It's not something that should, will be glossed over. This is something that bears much responsibility. It bears much accountability. You know, what did, what did Jesus tell us about those who preached and teached? About the responsibility that we have? He said that we would bear more accountability than those who were not teachers or preachers. So there's a heavier responsibility on that. And so that's what Paul is talking about here with uh, young Timothy here, giving him instructions about those who would be led uh, to be a leader of a church. What about a prophet? Well, I mean, prophets are, are mentioned uh, as... as are, they, uh, are they above masters? I think they are. No. Um, let's look at it this way. I'm, I'm, I'm very believing that there are people who are prophetic. I think mostly today, I think most people who t take that title on are blowing a bunch of smoke. Probably. Um, I know that, I mean, if you just go on, go on YouTube one day just for fun and just just type in profit and then there you go. You just look at the search results. 
Uh, there's there's a couple that uh, that are up, that are kind of prominent. They have a huge following, and you know they predict all kinds of stuff. And some of the st I've listened to a few of them just because I want to hear what they have to say. And uh, a lot of it's just nonsense. Um, Prediction. When the rapture will happen. Yeah, you know, stuff like that. That's a, you know, we have a clear indication of what a true prophet is, is, is that somebody uh, will get a, a prophetic utterance and it'll come true. Um, but, you know, here's the thing I would say is that this, this idea of uttering prophecies I think if someone's truly discerning, I think you can pick up on whether or not they're being true or honest. I think there, there's a certain level of discernment that you can use and you can pick up on it. You know, a lot of times, you know, if you listen to somebody, it doesn't take long to pick up some red flags. Yeah. Now, there are people who are really, really good uh, with their observational skills. You, all right, let me take for instance, prior to November 2020, a lot of people could have forecasted what is happening today. I've said it. Now, am I a prophet? No. I'm just observational. I think people can make very astute observational judgments and they're not prophets but I think a lot of people have these observational skills and they attach profit to it to get a following you know there a lot of these people predict these these prophetic things that there's something extra when you read the book of Revelation that was the end of these these new prophecies yeah. Yeah. these new prophetic revelations I think it ends in revelation yeah. Yeah. and so you know again I'm not saying that there that there aren't any prophets because when you look at what Peter said when on the day of Pentecost when he was preaching he preached a message out of Joel that said that when you know in the end times that your sons and daughters will prophesy So I'm not going to discount it. I'm also not going to discount it for the fact that Paul said that those were one of the one of the major spiritual gifts was prophecy. So I can't discount it. Um, but I think it's our understanding of it, just like with tongues. You know, he said that that was one of the greater gifts was the the gift of tongues. Now. My understanding of the gift of tongues and what some people understand as the gift of tongues are entirely different. But I think it's how we it's in how we understand it. And so I, I believe the same thing with, with prophecy. So as Christians it take I think it takes us a great deal of discernment, which we don't practice much either. <laughs> Our, uh, so obviously, being being the leader, um, it's a noble task. Uh, again, what he's saying there: this is not easy and should not be taken lightly. That's that's how the language here in this verse uh, is really used. Uh, the next one comes out of chapter three, verse eight. Kind of deals with the same thing, except this time it says deacons. Likewise, must be dignified, not double tongued, nor addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. Now. In both scenarios, there's a long list of things that, that Paul mentions that they there's some strict adherence to as far as if you want to be a pastor, here's some things that you need, to, uh, some strict guidelines that need to be followed. Same thing with deacons. That's what I was talking about earlier, you know, with elders, uh, you know, it, with, with Quakers or in the Quaker uh, faith, we call them elders. Uh, in the Baptist, they call them deacons. Um, I know uh, I know Wesleyans call them something else, but most churches have some sort of elder board, deacon board, uh, a group of normally less than ten people uh, who 
take care of a lot of the, the more personal business decisions should be the spiritual decisions of the church. Now, now this, now this is the part I've always, I have always appreciated about how the Friends, Quakers, do things as far as business is concerned. One person or a small group of people do not collectively have any power whatsoever. I have seen too many churches where they have given power to one person to make all decisions or to five or six people. I do not think that's a good thing because power will corrupt. And so when you put it in the power or when you dispense the power, you take care of some of that automatically. And so with that, that at least that one thing, I think they did get it right. You know, there's some other things I question, but that one, I like that one. I think that's a good good practice. But here it talks about these these deacons and, and the, the things that they have. So again, just like with how pastors are put in positions of leadership, there's a lot of responsibility that is placed on who is put in uh, in an elder position. You know, how are they living? Are they living uh, up to a biblical standard? You know, are these people good stewards of what God has given them? So there's some very strict guidelines here uh, that needed to be addressed because, again, not everybody needs to be in a place of leadership because they're just not good leaders. And a lot of times their lives show that. And so Paul's just trying to put these, these instructions in place so that there be a well-structured, a godly, that's one of the things that, that's brought out in both instances, that these need to be godly maintained positions. And if they go against those things, then they need to be removed. Our next key scripture comes from chapter 4. Now, I, I did purposely um, skipped over the stuff about women. Um, you probably read that. Um, if you want to go over that some other time in more detail, we will because there's, uh, there's a lot to that. And we would have to talk about the, the culture, the customs, um, the abuses, and how we should relay it today. And it's, it's a lot more than we can cover today. Um, so if that's something you want to cover when we get done with this study completely, uh, that's something that we can look at. Because I, I think it does deserve some attention. Um, I've got 30 minutes of silence Sunday. <laughs> you know what there? You heard my joke, did you? <laughs> oh, is it a joke? <laughs> yeah. The, the joke heard around the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you saw me. Yeah. <laughs> Don't throw stones at me. Uh, the, there's more where that came from. <laughs> I can't believe you said that. <laughs> did you laugh though? I did. Okay, there you go. Yeah. That that was the point. Just have a little laughter. <laughs> um, our next key verse comes from chapter four, verse seven through eight. Paul says, "Have nothing to do with irreverent." silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Alright, so again, here's some, some cultural things that we got to deal with. Uh, in Greco-Roman society, physical fitness was high on the priority list. Being very athletic, um, you know, the Olympic Games sprung out of this culture. Uh, wrestling, as you, as you know, there's a there's an entire thing for Greco-Roman wrestling uh, that's still you know still done today. So you know the, their their sporting events, their athleticism, uh, the their competitiveness, those things were very high importance to them um, as as far as that goes. So you know. Paul is, is dealing with this, this issue that, yes, it, in some regards, that's, that's an important issue because if you want to stay 
you know, healthy and possibly live longer, then yeah, you should take care of yourself uh, in in certain ways. But he's here. He's talking about the spiritual self is more important because it doesn't only it doesn't only take care of this life, but it takes care of the one to come. So you know you can um, you can be as athletic and uh, astute a wrestler as humanly possible, be the best of the best, but that's not going to matter in eternity if your soul's not right. So he's just saying, you know, he's simply saying that you know this idea uh, that you know uh, you put more emphasis on that, you don't need to to neglect that. But he's saying you really need to put more time into the study of the Word of God because you're, again, daily living, godly living, holiness, that all comes from studying the Word of God and living it out. So that has daily benefits in the present while we're here. But the real dividends come afterwards. In being in the presence of our Savior, that's the re that's the real reward. It has usefulness here, but it has much more usefulness when we get to heaven. So that's he's placing that emphasis on that holiness that they need to live these holy lives. Um, train yourself for godliness. Again, something I think the church has fell short on: discipleship. I think there, the, it seems like in the last 10 years, there's there's been more of a push to get back to that. I think a lot in the church have realized that that's kind of fallen to the wayside. And so I, I'm glad to see that. There has been a, a kind of a resurgence in uh, doing good discipleship. Well, another thing, after a person gets saved, they... The church needs to follow up on them and, 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 and keep uh, communications flowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that that's a big thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. Yeah, I really do. Um, and I th I think that's in a way I think that's where that discipleship fell off yeah. is because yeah. you know I think you were mentioning earlier that you know. Um, Think, you know, you've seen with with people who run down to the altar or people who've gotten baptized, they really didn't understand really what they were doing. Right. And the church just kind of let them go, and yeah. you know, instead of taking them under their wing and discipling them, you know, uh, it, it, we kind of fail at that. So, especially small kids. Yeah. Yeah. They. Don't do yeah. They, they, yeah. I, I think. Uh, I think kids. They, it needs to be explained to them in a way they understand what they're doing. You know, and, and I do believe that there are some young people who, who understand that God's calling them and they do make a personal confession uh, and you know they live a life accordingly. But I think far too many people say, well, you know, I got saved when I was a kid, but th then there's no, there's absolutely no evidence that the Holy Spirit ever got a hold of them. None. But then they get saved later in life. Right. Amen. You know, now maybe something stuck with them. Something, you know, because we know Isaiah says that God's word does not return void. Maybe they heard something that was in the back of their mind. But far too many people follow on that and say, well, you know, I got saved years ago. I'm good to go. What, what does your life say? When your life says you're not, you don't know God. So. Kevin, it went with me. I was probably 10 or 11 years old, and they did this to all the youth because we had a lot of youth, but you were teamed up with an adult, and you had Bible school for a whole week then. Yeah. You went in there and you taught Bible school, and they mm -hmm. sat with you. And then you were teamed up with a Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why I always loved to teach children because it was just... It yeah. wasn't a choice. You just, yeah. you know, and I didn't even think of it as yeah. discipleship then. I was yeah. just like, I got to go from there, but yeah. it made a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does make a big difference. 
Our next key verse comes from chapter 5, verses 20 through 21. He says, as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. In the, uh, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Now, here's one of those instances where I, I, I think that it's, this is talking about leadership. If you read it, it's talking about elders. Now, again, here, this is talking about somebody who has persisted in sin. So, again, this kind of goes back to what Jesus had taught about how to approach someone who was a sinner. You and a brother, if you and a brother have an issue, go to them and try and take care of it. If that doesn't work, then you and somebody else go to that brother and try to resolve it. Then if that don't work, you get more people involved. And if that don't work, then it probably ain't going to work. And that person's just being a horse's patootie. And maybe they need to go somewhere else. But, you know, generally, most people, you never, I don't think you ever really get to those other stages. Now, there might be a case there somewhere where you get to this, but I, I don't know that I've ever heard, really heard of it. But he's, but notice what he says here. He, he, he says, do this with somebody who is very persistent in their sin. Now, again, remember at the very beginning what he talked about. He talked about false teachers, people who were teaching false doctrines. All right, so he's, he, he, I think he's narrowing in on select people, select leaders. He's giving... I think really clear instruction on how the church handles that. This is I don't think this is purely talking about your everyday person who comes in the church. Because remember what Christ said, people who people who end up being leaders, they have a lot more accountability, a lot more responsibility. So here, now I might be wrong, he may be talking to the general congregation, but here I think he's talking about these leaders, these people who are deliberately teaching false doctrines. He's already told them, said, you tell them there's certain people who don't need to teach such things. Well, here, they're continuing in their sin. They keep talking about it. So he says, you know, here's a chance where you need to deal with these people. But then he says, he said, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Well, what do we like to do? We like to prejudge. And if we like somebody, we're a little partial. You know, it's it's very it's very hard. You know, if, if you're in a room with people, it's very hard to be partial, especially if there's somebody in the room that you know really well. But see, you know, that's that's where the Bible the Bible tells us. You know, we have to put aside the partiality, the favoritism. We need to look at look at the issue objectively. Don't prejudge it based on what we think. We need to be very discerning. You know, we're, we're not very discerning these days. Discerning means we look at every possible scenario. That's what that means. Most of the time, we don't think of any scenarios. We just automatically prejudge and boom. You know, we're done with it. He's telling here, he said, even though here's the things I want you to adhere to, he also puts a little disclaimer on it. Don't be pretty judgy and don't show partiality. I think that's good wisdom right there. And chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. He says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy, for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions.
That sounds like people who like to stir the pot. You ever met any of them? I've met a few of them before. But there are people who teach different things. And, and it's, it's almost like, you know, they, they try and cause division or strife. And, you know, he tells us, he tells us we need to be looking out for those. He tells us how to do it. He tells us why they do these things too. They have this craving. That's why they do these things. They have a craving for it. So that, that tells us right off the bat, that tells us a little bit of their ungodliness. That they're not very humble. And our last key verse comes from chapter 6, also verses 9 through 10. He said, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Now, I mean, today that's, a, that's something that we, we see a lot uh, in the church world as far as like, start looking at televangelists. I mean, if you just look, it doesn't take much. Just look. There is a craving for more and more and more. You know, what are, the, what are they doing with all this? Well, if you look at what some of them's net worth are, you realize what they're doing with it. Now, to be fair, uh, you know, I know one person comes to mind. Um... Now, I, I can't just completely throw them under the bus, but, uh, you know, they have a small, you know, a large, well, not small, they have a large compound. Um, but, you know, a lot of their wealth comes from book sales. A lot of them do. Um, but, you know, the, the things that they get from their ministries um, also are put into some of these things. So, you know, I just have a hard time trusting people like that. But Paul tells us here, again, he's talking about leadership. Um, that people who have that craving, that love of money, will do all kinds of evil things. Now, it, it, it dawned on me. Um, Judas. Yeah, he kept the money. Now... Perhaps, you know, I, I still think, you know, because we don't, we weren't there. We don't know 100% for sure, and we do not have a detailed account of everything that he thought that went into it prior to his decision and afterwards. We're given snippets. Uh, so we have to go off some speculation. You know, um, we know that he could have very well been a zealot. And if you understand a zealot, a zealot was somebody who wanted the kingdom to initiate so that they would overthrow the Roman government. Now, there is a, uh, an idea out there, a theory, that Judas was a zealot. And the reason that he went ahead and betrayed Jesus was because he wanted that kingdom to be initiated. Now, we did see some remorse from Judas after his decision. He did try to take the money back, but he had a craving for money, too. Because if it was just about taking the kingdom or establishing the kingdom, he could have turned Jesus over without the money. So, here we have a case where Judas may have had that craving for more money. And it led him down a path of evil. That root. Now, my, a lot of people will say that money is the root of all it. No, that is not what it love, says. Love, love, it love. said, for the love of money can produce all kinds of evil. 
So we need to make sure that we get that right. Uh, there were some very wealthy people that uh, helped Jesus out. Uh, two of them, namely, was Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Both very wealthy individuals. Um, and they will forever be remembered as uh, the, the two that uh, took Jesus down off the cross and put him into the tomb fulfilling prophecy. So, being wealthy doesn't classify you as a sinner, but when your love for money, I guess this was fall under the thing of gluttony, uh, when you just never have enough, and uh, there was a statement by Rockefeller that was made one time, somebody interviewed him and said, uh, how much money would make you happy, because you know, obviously he had a lot of it, and his answer was just one more dollar. More, more, more. Just one more dollar. So, uh, you know, there was somebody who was in love with money. So, anyway, um, very, this is a very good book, uh, very good book of the Bible. Uh, chapter 2, I mean, uh, 2 Timothy, what we'll cover next week, um, gets into uh, some more stuff. Uh, he gets a little more prophetic uh, in 2 Timothy, talking more about the end times and some of the signs that we will see. Um, as we get closer to that time, he doesn't predict it. He just said there's some things to look for, you know, to look for. Same as Jesus, you know, there's signs that will, you know, be that we'll see. So uh, go ahead and read Second Timothy. It's not that long, uh, but it's very good too. It uh, has a lot of very good deep teaching. And again, uh, First, Second Timothy, and Titus are an, an instruction manual to the church. Uh, so every, every church member needs to read the book, these three books uh, at least once a year. So, well, that's all I have today. Do y'all have anything else? Any other comments or questions or anything?